Guitar lessons and tips Q&A. That's what we're going to do today. My goal is to help you be a better guitar player and uh, we're going to start right now answering your questions. Uh, so I'm going to start with some questions that were sent in advance. If you have questions as we go, I'd love for you to throw those in the chat and I'll be keeping an eye on the chat uh, so that I can answer those. Uh, so let me just uh, keep an eye uh, on the chat. So. Uh, the first question I'm going to answer is from Alan McCarthy. Uh, he said, muting unwanted bass and melody notes. Uh, so how do you go about muting unwanted bass and melody notes? Well, I have a few uh, suggestions on that. And uh, so let me go ahead and uh, talk about that. So uh, when you're muting the bass, this is really the more problematic uh, area for muting. Uh, muting the trebles is not uh, as problematic. The trebles just don't ring over as much. But uh, when dealing with the basses, you can really have some unwanted ring over. So uh, let's say you're going, for example, from an E chord to a D chord, and you still have that E ringing. It's really a bit of a dissonance. Uh, you know, there might be some circumstances where you'd want that, but in many cases, you don't want that E ringing anymore uh, when you go to that D chord. So what I would suggest in that instance is, you know, maybe use your right hand thumb and put your right hand thumb on the sixth string to damp the E. Uh, so a lot of times for damping the basses, the thumb is my tool. And I'll, you know, maybe plant the tip of the thumb back on that bass string. Uh, maybe I'll use the side of my thumb. So, um, you know, just laying the side of the thumb against the string I'm trying to mute. Try not to make a noise with it while I do it. And you can either mute with the thumb before, during, or after the next bass note. And my favorite way is to do it afterwards. That's probably the easiest and it creates more legato because there's a slight ring over. So let's say I play this E chord and then this D chord. I just put my thumb back on the E after playing the D bass note and it's just very smooth and connected. Now you can do it before so like and you know, that's probably a little harder because then you got to jump your thumb to get to the D bass note. And so that's not my favorite, but maybe there's a situation where I'd need to do that if I need the thumb to do something immediately thereafter. Uh, or you can even do it uh, during playing the D bass note if you use the side of thumb. So you play the E and then you use the side of the thumb uh, to mute the E uh, as you're playing the D. Uh, so those are some different ways I would do it. Uh, you know, sometimes in some cases you may be able to mute with the left hand, uh, laying the left hand fingers across a string or touching a left hand finger to a particular string. Um, or you may be able to lay the whole right hand across um, the strings, your right hand palm, uh, the side of it just against the strings would be another way to mute. Uh, so thank you to Alan McCarthy for that question on muting. If you have other questions, uh, feel free to drop those in the chat and I'd be delighted to answer those. And um, if you, you know, have questions on things that we're talking about, uh, just feel free to drop those in the chat. Uh, so Abel Perez says, what is your process when learning a new piece from start to end? Uh, well, my process starts with what I call mapping, and this is getting really clear on what I want to do both technically and expressively. You know, years ago, I used to start with just the technical and only the fingerings and not worry about the expressive, the dynamics and things like that until much later. Uh, but then I was really influenced by uh, Matt Hinsley, who's a very good guitarist and teacher uh, who runs Austin Classical Guitar. And uh, Matt really challenged me to think about the expressive details earlier in the learning process. And so I found that to be very helpful to myself and my students. Uh, so I'll talk about that learning process. And I see Gord put in the chat, what kind of guitar are you playing today? Uh, so this is a 1980 Robert Ruck. Robert Ruck is an American luthier, or was. He passed away a couple years ago. Uh, but he was an, uh, an amazing luthier. And I really enjoy this uh, 1980 instrument of his. Uh, this guitar is valued around $10,000. And it has a, um, a Brazilian rosewood back and sides. It has a European spruce top. Uh, the back of the neck is Spanish cedar and the fingerboard is ebony. And I just really love the sound of this particular guitar. So Gordon, thank you for that question. Uh, so I'm going to take this question from Abel about learning a piece. And he said, you know, what is your process from start to end? So again, I start off with mapping the technical and expressive details of the piece. 
And so I'm going to take as an example Carcassi A23 from the Opus 60 uh, Melodious and Progressive Studies by Carcassi. And so let's just pretend that I were learning uh, Carcassi's A23 for the first time. How would I go about it? Well, again, first off, I'm going to think about technical details. So in the right hand, I'm going to have a repeating pattern that's like P I M A I M A I M P I M. So I'm going to be planning out the technique of the right hand. So like as thumb play. I get the index middle ring ready. Then as uh, the ring plays, I get index ready. Index plays, I get middle ready. Middle plays, I get ring ready. Then index ready, middle ready, thumb ready. Then at the end of the measure, I am ready. So for the right hand of Carcassi Etude 3, I'm doing planting. And um, so I either do group planting as in beats one and four or sequential planting as on beats two and three. So I plant as a group. Uh, at the beginning, and so I, M, A are all down on the string. Then here, this next middle part, I do all individual planting, just planting one finger at a time. At the end of the measure, I plant I and M together. And so that's part of my mapping as I learn a piece is, okay, what is the right hand doing here? And this particular piece has a very repetitive right hand pattern. Then what's the left hand doing? So basically the left hand has um, an A, C sharp, and F sharp, and then it's gonna go to the open first string, the open E. So if you're learning this piece for the first time, you might just figure out, okay, what's the left hand doing? And then work to put those two things together. And so I'd be mapping, I'd be writing in my left hand fingering, my right hand fingering in the score. Then I would think about expression. I'd, I'd go ahead and jot a few notes in the score there as well. So do I wanna play the F sharp a little louder than the E in the melody? You know, then I'd, I'd put a little maybe accent on the F sharp and a little decrescendo to the E to indicate that's what I wanted to do. And then I'd kind of continue through the piece like that, mapping out the technical details and the expressive details. Uh, then next, I'd go to what I call the learning stage. So let's say I've got mapped out, I know exactly what fingerings I'm gonna use in the right hand, in the left hand. I know what uh, dynamic shaping and things like that I wanna do. Then I'm just trying to get myself to learn that program, so to speak, and so, um, you know, so let's say I'm, I have the mapping done, now I'm learning. And I'm trying to play the technical and expressive details that I've mapped out. Now, if that's going well, then I move to a next stage, which I call polishing, which is just small details. So again, if I'm playing that same passage again, I'm just listening for anything that doesn't sound quite right to me, and then I'm trying to polish it. So I might say, hmm, those accents are sticking out a little bit. I wonder if I could do the expression more fluidly across the whole first four measures. And so that would be, again, part of polishing. Can I make it flow uh, expressively over the first four measures? And then I would evaluate, yeah, I think that was a little better. I think I had a more uh, sort of gradated um, dynamic. I was more gradually crescendoing as the melody rose. And so that would be part of the polishing stage. Then I'd get to the memorizing stage. If I didn't have the piece by memory, then I'd be testing my memory, maybe a few measures at a time. Um, and I wouldn't really do this until I felt like, yeah, I'm really, really confident playing it from the page. But if I was, then I'd say, okay, now can I do it by memory? And so that would be testing my memory. And then the final stage would be performing uh, where I'd wanna perform it in front of an audience, like maybe this live stream. Uh, so I'd want to uh, actually try out the piece in front of other people. So uh, that's kind of how I learn a piece. If you have more questions about that process, let me know, but that was a good question from Abel Perez. I see in the chat that Gord says, is Cordoba guitars made by a group of people or by a luthier? So uh, Cordoba is a company, and so that is a group of people. It's a, it's a whole team 
a whole company uh, that makes guitars. And so certainly as you get to higher end guitars, a lot of times you get into guitars built by a single luthier like Robert Ruck, the builder of my guitar. But um, yeah, a company like uh, Cordoba or Alvarez or some of those uh, companies that make classical guitars, those are made by a whole team uh, a whole company of people. And uh, there are some very good guitars made by companies like uh, Cordoba. Alhambra is another brand that I like of classical guitars. Uh, but again, it just depends. If you're going to get into a very high-end instrument, a lot of times it's nice to have one built by a single luthier. Um, so, so where's everybody watching from today? I'd love to see in the chat uh, where you're watching the stream from today, and I appreciate you tuning in today. Um, and again, if you have questions, put them in the chat, and I'll be glad to respond to those. And I'll continue with another question that I got in advance. Uh, this was from Alan McCarthy talking about wrist and thumb injuries. So uh, what happens if you have a wrist and thumb injury? How do you avoid wrist and thumb injuries? So I'll talk a little bit first about pre preventing wrist and thumb injuries. And I have uh, had tendinitis, and it's quite unpleasant. And I know people that have had carpal tunnel syndrome and other things like that. So uh, generally, the best thing to do is to avoid those types of injuries if you possibly can. And, you know, in avoiding those injuries, um, it helps if you um, think about the amount of time you're spending practicing. You know, sometimes uh, you can cause an injury by dramatically increasing um, your practice time overnight. Um, so going from, you know, let's say 30 minutes a day of practice overnight to, um, you know, suddenly you're playing like two hours a day or something like that, uh, you may cause an injury. So if you're used to playing 30 minutes a day, you might want to, you know, the next week go to an hour a day and then the week after that go to an hour and a half a day and then the week after that go to two hours a day. You know, gradually increasing your practice is a way to avoid injury. And... Uh, then um, another thing I would say about avoiding injury is just using ergonomic technique. And er by ergonomic, I mean that your wrists are in the mid-range of their movement. They're not super bent. Um, and so they're just in the mid-range, that your fingers are moving with uniform direction of joint movement, uh, that you're not kind of like extending one joint while you're contracting another. Uh, so mid-range position of joints, uh, uniform direction of joint movement, those help avoid uh, the wrist and thumb injuries. Um, so I see in the chat, uh, London uh, Voyage, you're watching from London. Uh, so welcome, uh, Voyage. And then I see Gord is from north of Toronto. And then I see a question, can you play uh, Johnny B. Good? And he says, I'm from the UK. Thanks for the question. You know, I'm sure I could play Johnny B. Good. That's not something I've practiced uh, this particular week. Uh, so I don't have it kind of fresh in my ears, fresh in my hands. Uh, but I'll keep that in mind as a possibility to break out in a future live stream. But no, I don't have Johnny B. Good under my fingers right at the moment. Um, and then Voyage says, I haven't been able to practice for a week with two broken nails. Well, that's frustrating. You know, if you're playing with classical technique, uh, we get very, um, very used to playing with nails. And so anytime we break nails, it can become much more difficult uh, to, you know, make that work. I will say you can certainly practice with just the fingertips or you can use artificial nails, but I know that's not um, as much fun. So, or, you know, just doesn't work as well with classical technique. So um, I see Voyage say the nail extensions are no good for me, the plastic and metal ones. And yeah, I understand uh, maybe using uh, nail extensions is not ideal, but um, I certainly have used artificial nails at times. Uh, usually acrylics are one that I have used. And so uh, that's, uh, you know, that's certainly a possibility. Um, I'm going to go back to Alan's question for a second. And... Um, Alan's question is uh, about the wrist and thumb injuries. So one of the things I'd say about avoiding wrist and thumb injuries is avoiding uh, counterproductive tension. And uh, you know, if you find that you're using more effort than you really need uh, to use, then um, you know you want to find what's the minimum pressure in the left hand, what's the minimum force in the right hand, that sort of thing uh, that you're going to need. Um, now. Another thing I would say is taking frequent breaks in your practice. You know, if your hands are getting super fatigued, uh, you want to go ahead and, and take some frequent breaks. Uh, that'll help you avoid 
um, some of the uh, the injuries. And notice non-guitar causes too. You know, in other words, is typing on a computer keyboard causing part of your hand issues? Is uh, using your phone too much or doing too many computer games tiring your hands out? Uh, those are things uh, to think about as well. Um, now, if you have an injury to your hands, then I would say um, you want to maybe reduce your practice time. I would suggest icing uh, your affected area, your wrist or your forearm or your finger or thumb or whatever it is. Um, and I would also say uh, taking an anti-inflammatory medication can be helpful if you have tendonitis or something like that. But I would encourage you at that point, if you have an injury, go ahead and consult a physician. Uh, they may be able to guide you specifically what medicine would help, uh, what kind of icing, maybe even some stretches you could do, uh, some maybe physical therapy exercises you could do. Uh, but definitely if you can avoid um, you know, injuries in the first place, that's a good thing. So if you guys have uh, further questions, uh, feel free to drop those uh, in the chat. Um, another advanced question that I had was from Bluesy Bluesman. He said, can you give information about ear training of a guitarist? Um, how do you go about ear training? Well, one of the things I would suggest for ear training would be simply uh, listening to a melody and then can I play this back on the guitar? You know, even if it's just a very simple melody, um, you know, or perhaps it's like a famous rock riff or something, you know, can I listen to Crazy Train? You know, and, and duplicate that on the guitar. Um, you know, if it's a chord progression uh, of a particular song and you're listening to the chord progression, hey, can I do that? Can I play the chord progression for, you know, whatever this popular song is? Um, and so just playing melodies and chords by ear is a really good way um, to develop your ear. But um, I would also say, as far as resources for ear training, I would say to check out musictheory.net. Uh, they have some really good ear training exercises at musictheory.net. And then also teoria.com, it's T-E-O-R-I-A.com. Both musictheory.net and teoria.com have really good resources uh, for ear training. And so you can do kind of these like recognizing what interval you're hearing or recognizing what chord you're hearing, and it will tell you immediately on those sites whether you're right or wrong. Now I see Gord saying, I use a white powder mixed with a special smelly liquid which hardens after shaping it into a new nail uh, or part of a nail. And yeah, there definitely are, again, it's kind of the uh, typically an acrylic of some sort, uh, acrylic powder, and it sort of combines with this liquid to make an artificial nail. So yeah, if you're needing a, a replacement for a broken nail, uh, that can work. So thank you, Gord, for that. Uh, another question I had was from Skeet Joystick, and uh, he said, uh, do you ever feel demotivated when struggling with a particular piece? Uh, the temptation to jump to a new piece is strong, but I just resist. And uh, that's an excellent question from Skeet. And I would say absolutely. I've, I've definitely been demotivated about a particular piece if it's really hard for me. And uh, I would say a couple of things. One of the things I would ask in that situation is, am I really committed to playing this piece? And if so, why? Why do I want to play this piece? Do I just love the way it sounds? You know, have I committed to play it in a performance that I have sometime soon or something like that? You know, why is it that I'm playing this particular piece? And then once I think about why, then that may reinforce my motivation and help me push through the difficulty. But if on the other hand, I find, you know, I'm just not really that committed to this piece, maybe I'll drop it for now and go to a new piece. Um, but if I decide, yeah, I really am committed to this piece, I wanna keep learning it, it still can be good to have two or three pieces that you can alternate among. So when you get really bored or really frustrated with this one piece, then you can uh, work on a different piece alongside it. And that way you can hopefully avoid some of the discouragement or, uh, you know, some of the frustration. Uh, so good question from Skeet Joystick. Uh, if you have questions, again, drop them in the chat. I'd love to hear what questions you have. Uh, do you have any questions about kind of how you go about uh, learning a piece? And by the way, I, someone had mentioned to me uh, over the past week that it might be interesting if sometimes uh, some of you guys send in a video of your playing and then I could critique the video during my live stream and offer feedback. So I'll just go ahead and throw that out for those of you that are watching. If any of you would be interested in sending me a video, um, you know, you could send me a video link um, through um, Dropbox or something like that or through um, you know, a, a link to an unlisted YouTube video or however you'd want to do that. But 
if any of you would want to send me a video, probably a short excerpt of you playing something that you'd want me to give some feedback or pointers, that's cer certainly something I'd be open to doing. I thought that was an interesting suggestion. So if any of you guys are interested in doing that uh, for next week's live stream, let me know. Obviously, I wouldn't be able to incorporate your video right now in this moment, but uh, if you want to send me one for next week, I'd be totally open to that possibility. So just wanted to throw that out there. Another question I got in advance was from Bob Richter. And Bob was asking about any advice on preventing string breakage. And I will say that what I find is if you're playing classical guitar, the strings don't break incredibly fast. Um, unlike maybe on a steel string acoustic or on electric guitar, sometimes they break a little more easily. Um, but on classical, they don't break quite as easily. But I would say a couple of things. Uh, one is you definitely don't want to tune them way too tight um, you know so for example if the first string is normally at e and you tune it up to like an f sharp or a g or you know you, you tune the string way past the tension it's supposed to normally be under that can make it a lot more likely to break and some players do use really strange alternate tunings and i I've used some strange alternate tunings at times but um, you know if you go too extreme with an alternate tuning that can break a string another thing to keep in mind is just change your strings every two to three months. Um, you know, if you are uh, not changing your strings for a year or two, yeah, you're going to have uh, an issue with the strings breaking. So I would suggest changing the strings every two to three months. Uh, another thing I would say is wash your hands before playing. Um, you know, a lot of times if you don't wash your hands uh, before playing, then uh, you're going to get all kinds of gunk on the strings and it's going to make them corrode and kind of wear out quicker. So I would say that's a simple way to avoid breaking your strings. So good question from Bob. Uh, then I had a question from uh, Chris Diggs and uh, he was asking any advice or resources you know about that could help me compose and arrange for a guitar quartet. Well, I love uh, the music of guitar quartet. You know, obviously Los Angeles guitar quartet um, is a great group, uh, Los Hermeros. You know, there's some really fantastic uh, guitar quartets out there. And I think it's great to want to compose or arrange music for guitar quartet. Uh, but how would you get started, Chris asked. Well, one of the ways to get started is to take something like Bach chorales, uh, which are already you know, four-part compositions, and just uh, sort of put the Bach chorale notes on four treble clefs as if it was for four um, guitars, and just sort of get used to how that works, how that sounds. You know, Maybe do that in a program like Finale or something like that. Um, and uh, you know, I find that it can be really good to uh, just get used to how the Bach chorales fit on um, the guitar. Then once you start with something like that, then maybe take a familiar melody, you know, either a folk melody or even a pop song or something you know well, and think about putting that in one guitar part and then putting the other notes of the chord in like the guitar two, three, and four parts. And that can be a really good approach. Uh, then and then once you get used to doing that maybe trade the melody around because if you're actually writing for a guitar quartet uh, Players get bored if they never get to play the melody So maybe have the melody in guitar one for a while and then the melody goes to guitar two for a while Kind of depends on the group you're writing for you know Some groups may really like just keeping the melody in guitar one all the time because the other players on the other parts are less Experienced and they need easier parts But if that's not the case if you have more experienced players then it can be nice to kind of trade the melody uh, around to different um, different parts. Um, and, you know, I ran across an article, if you Google power in numbers in, in classical guitar, uh, there was an article in the Classical Guitar Magazine from 2017 called Power in Numbers uh, by Mark Houghton, who's a composer. And so um, I think it would be uh, a great thing for Chris wanting to compose and arrange for guitar quartet to check out what Mark Houghton has to say about how to arrange for guitar quartet. Um, and I see Voyage put in the chat every three months. I've had my current set uh, for two years. And um, yeah, again, I understand that some people really try to stretch out their strings and, you know, or maybe not stretch them physically, but just make them last for a very long time. I do understand that. Uh, but what I find is they do start to lose some of the tone quality after really honestly after maybe 20 or 30 hours of playing on them. So it kind of depends how much you play. But let's say you play an hour a day. If you play an hour a day, um, then over the course of a month, you've played 30 hours on the strings. They're probably starting to lose some of their 
uh, their brightness and their tone after the first month or so. So yeah, if you don't change them after two or three months, then um, they're definitely going to be sounding more dead, less resonant. But yeah, I get it. Again, some people will keep them on there for a couple of years or keep them on there till they break. I do understand that. Uh, but it's going to tend to sound a lot better if you keep uh, uh, changing your strings on a regular basis. Now, I see uh, Voyage uses ProArt uh, Classical Normal Tension, so ProArt from D'Addario. Those are good strings. I used ProArts for many years. I've used Augustine's as well. Uh, for the last you know, 10 or more years, I've been using Savarez uh, Corum Basses and Alliance Trebles, which I really like. But certainly, you know, the D'Addario strings are nice. And Voyage says, maybe it's time for a change, but it's tedious work changing strings. And so, yeah, it definitely is. Now I have a peg winder, you know, you can get these peg winders for a very small amount of money, like a dollar, a couple dollars, or I guess if you're in the UK, you know, a pound or something like that. But, you know, but you can get a peg winder that will help you speed up the process of taking the string on and off. And that'll make it a little less unpleasant. Uh, to change your strings. Um, now, Gord says, if only one string breaks, should I then change all six? And that would be my recommendation. Um, I would say if you break one, I would encourage changing all six. I mean, you know, there might be exceptions to that. If like you break it right before a performance or something, then you're going to change that, uh, that one and just go on stage or something like that. But if on the other hand, you're just in the normal routine of your practice and you break one, I'd probably change all of them because I want them to be even in wear. You know, if I have one that's brand new and it sounds bright and all the others are two years old and they sound dead, then that, that new one's gonna stick out and it's gonna sound very different. So I'd rather change all of them at the same time and have them sound uh, similar. You know, at, for a while I tried to uh, sort of arrange for like, okay, I'll save these old ones and you know, I can use them later. But the problem is, um, at least for me, the string that breaks the most is the fourth string. And so what I ended up having is I, when I kept saving these old sets, like, oh, maybe I'll put the, the other strings on later, it was always the fourth string that broke. So I had like four old sets uh, of strings with no fourth string, and my other strings were never breaking, so I never needed those old strings. So I would say it's maybe not super useful to, to hold back those other strings, you know, to see if something else breaks. Uh, but good question there from, uh, um, from uh, Gord in the chat. So um, <laughs> Gord says, I'm going to need a bank loan. Well, you know, it depends. You can find uh, strings sometimes for a discount. Um, I like to buy from stringsbymail.com. And if you buy in bulk, you can save money on strings. Um, but you know, in the grand scheme of things, uh, strings aren't super expensive. If you're changing every two to three months, like I'm suggesting, um, you know, let's say you're able to get a set of strings for, you know, maybe 15 US dollars. Well, that's like $60 a year. Um, so I'd imagine there's a lot more things in life that cost more than $60 a year. Uh, so if you really enjoy playing guitar, I don't think $60 a year is, is too bad necessarily. And then I see Ash is writing something that looks like maybe, Ash, you didn't finish your question, perhaps. So if you, uh, if you have something else to add to that, Ash, I'll come back to it. It just says advice for applying. And then there's a letter Y. Looks like you didn't quite finish um, your question there. But uh, another uh, question that I got was from Lloyd Lockhart. And he was asking my opinion about solid poplar wood tops versus solid pine wood tops. Uh, and what's the tone difference? Well, I would say for a classical guitar, I don't see poplar or pine tops very often. Really, the tops that I see the most are cedar and spruce. And my particular guitar is a spruce top, but I've also played some cedar tops that I really like. Uh, but I don't see pine and poplar tops on classical guitars very often. I know those are used in electric guitars a lot. They're not used so much in uh, acoustic and classical guitars. Uh, but with that said, I read a little on the internet and what I saw on the internet seemed to indicate that poplar really doesn't work well for a classical guitar top, but that a pine top could work, um, you know, for a classical guitar top. So, you know, I think that's possible. But again, spruce and cedar are really the ideal woods for the top of a classical guitar. So Ash, I see you've written more of your question. Uh, do you have any advice for applying to conservatories for your graduate master's degree? Uh, good question. So uh, when you're applying for a master's degree, I would say uh, you want to make sure that you have a really solid uh, program for your auditions. 
Uh, typically, you'll have your senior recital from your bachelor's degree and you're gonna take music from that. Uh, one of the things I would advise is checking into audition requirements. Uh, sometimes a school will put some things on as audition requirements and they're not as committed as you might think. So uh, what I mean is, let's say you were playing the first lute suite by Bach and on the audition requirements it says um, you need to apply with the fourth lute suite by Bach. Well, then you may think, hey, I got to go out and I've got to learn the whole fourth lute suite before I can audition for that master's program. Uh, well, you may be able to just contact the teacher and say, hey, I know the first lute suite, is that okay? And very often the teacher will say, sure, oh, first lute suite, that's fine. Go ahead and play that uh, for your audition. So that would be one of the things I would suggest is just kind of confirming how does my senior recital repertoire that I'm currently playing line up with the audition requirements of this particular master's program and this particular teacher? Uh, because again, you may have um, repertoire that works great and you don't have to uh, go out and learn a bunch of new repertoire for the master's program. If you haven't already done your senior recital, then definitely I would think about strategizing your senior recital to choose some pieces that would work well for auditions. So for example, do you have a Bach piece on your senior recital? Bach is frequently requested in, in auditions for grad programs, so making sure you have that. Um, you know, do you have um, something that's maybe from the Segovia repertoire, like Ponce or Castellanova de Tesco or something like that. Do you have maybe some uh, Spanish music, um, you know, either Albanese or Granados or something like that? Do you have any South American, Barrios, et cetera? So, you know, just having kind of a diversity of repertoire, maybe something classical period like Asor or Giuliani, um, but really having a diversity of repertoire helps. Um, now, I hope I'm answering your question, and Ash, feel free to uh, add if there are more aspects to your question, but when I think about the actual audition itself, if you're walking into an audition or if you're recording, um, those two are a little different, um, but let's say if you're walking into a face-to-face -face audition, uh, you definitely want to be prepared with uh, sort of ways that you're going to keep yourself calm and avoid nerves getting to you. Um, so hopefully you've developed some strategies for coping with performance anxiety in that situation. Uh, you know, a few deep breaths helps. Just thinking things like quiet mind or enjoy the music can help with the performance anxiety. And if you're making a recording, um, you know, do you have a good microphone or something like that? If not, it may be worthwhile to buy um, a good microphone to help record your, uh, your audition video or audition um, audio recording. Um, you could pay an, a recording engineer to help you make a good recording. Um, I find a lot of times in this day and age, it's really helpful if you can actually develop your own skills of audio recording. And, uh, you know, like right now in this live stream, I'm using a mic that's a, a Samson CO1U Pro, which is a USB mic. This is not a particularly expensive mic, but I think it sounds good with a guitar. Uh, so you can go out and you can find a USB mic for under 100 US dollars. And uh, so maybe that's a better option than trying to book a recording studio and pay a lot of money to make your master's audition um, you know, recording. So hopefully that helps. Ash, if you have other follow-ups based on what I just said, let me know. Uh, if there are others uh, who have questions, feel free to drop those in the chat. I'd love to answer other questions. Um, a question that I got in advance was from Gene Madsen. And he was talking about uh, that he had a classical guitar instructor who played Baroque guitar. And Gene was wondering, like, how hard is it to go from a classical guitar to a Baroque guitar or a lute or something like that? Well, I've played around a little bit uh, with lutes and Baroque guitars. And what I would say is it's not that hard to transition. You know, the feel of plucking and fretting and all that, you know, feels fairly similar on those period instruments. Uh, one of the big... Um, things to think about when you're going to a, a period instrument is are you going to use nails on both or not use nails on both because um, you know there's a lot of people that believe strongly hey when you're playing on period instruments um, you should not use nails and if you're playing on a modern classical you should use nails so uh, if you're comfortable using nails on both your modern and the period instrument then that's simple if you're comfortable not using nails on the modern instrument and the period instrument that's simple but if you feel really strongly like hey i need to have nails for my modern classical but i need to not have nails for my baroque guitar or my lute it's going to be a little hard so i would say just kind of making a decision on whether you're going to use nails or not and just stick with it for both uh, would be an easy way to go as far as switching back and forth. But as far as the feel of the instruments, they do feel fairly similar. You know, the Baroque guitars are smaller in body, so a lot of times you end up 
uh, using a strap for those. A lot of broke guitar players do. So that's a little different. Lute, of course, with the pear-shaped body, a lot of times you end up using a strap. Uh, but if you've you know played guitar with a strap in the past, that's maybe not a new thing for you. So um, I would say it's not a hugely hard transition to go to lute or to go to broke guitar. So thanks for that. Ash says, you're giving me a lot of ideas for choosing my repertoire. Thanks so much. So good, Ash, I'm glad that was helpful. Um, so yeah, as you guys have more questions, just drop those in the chat. Um, another question that I got in advance uh, was from Gord. He was talking about shifting and he was saying, what's more easy to do? Is it easier to, uh, to shift from a lower uh, fret to an upper fret or is it easier to shift from an upper fret back to a lower fret? And um, so I would say, yeah, probably gravity makes it a little easier to shift uh, to a higher in pitch fret. And by the way, you know, one of the things that's uh, super confusing to beginners on the guitar is the whole up and down thing. You know, like, hey, this is, this is down, this is up, you know, this is up, this is down. Like what? You know, again, when I talk about up and down a lot of the time, I'm talking about pitch. So, you know, we go up in pitch uh, this way, which is kind of down in physical location. We go down in pitch that way and, you know, go down in pitch across this way. We go up in pitch across this way. So I know it's confusing sometimes for uh, for beginners when we use that terminology. But, but again, I would say going from like the first fret to the eighth fret or something like that is probably easier than shifting back from the eighth to the first. Uh, so, uh, Gord, I see you're asking there in the chat, how much does this mic cost, uh, the Samson CO1U Pro? I believe you can get it, like I said, for under $100. I think it's maybe $90 uh, US uh, for this mic. And uh, then you say the stand. I assume you mean this music stand. This is a Manhasset music stand. Um, this is a pretty, uh, you know, it's solid, solid metal stand. So I think this music stand actually might be like more than $100 US, might be $150 US or something like that but it's really very solid and uh, so, so I enjoy it. I, in the past, um, you know, when I was trying to save money, I used to have folding metal stands. You can get a folding metal music stand for you know, 20 bucks and those work just fine. Uh, but for something a little more solid, a uh, little more reliable, I like these Manhasset stands, but again, they're a little pricier, maybe, maybe $150 US or something like that. Good question. Um, again, if any of you have other questions, drop them in the chat. And I really appreciate you tuning in to the live stream today uh, for some guitar tips. And I'd uh, love for you to hit the like button if you're enjoying what you're hearing. Um, oh, you're saying the stand for the mic, Gord says. Uh, so yeah, this mic stand, that's a good question. Uh, this is a DR Pro brand uh, mic stand. And it is a shorter mic stand because when I'm seated with the guitar, I want a short mic stand. I don't want like a tall vocal mic stand. Uh, so this short mic stand, um, I think this one was maybe $50 uh, US, something like that. And, um, but again, I do like the shorter uh, stand. I find that it, um, you know, it's much more convenient. One of the things I've had happen sometimes is I'll show up at a venue where I need to play uh, amplified and they only have a mic stand that's like vocal height up here and my guitar is down here when I'm sitting and you know it just doesn't work very well so I usually when I'm going to play amplified I just bring my own mic stand so it's a good height and this one will adjust down much lower right now I'm having it kind of between my you know my speaking voice and my guitar in the middle but I can lower it down directly in front of the guitar uh, when I'm just performing and so that's very handy so thanks for clarifying Gord that you were asking about the mic stand um, and then I see uh, Wanna Sleep says how to do vibrato and how to practice vibrato. So vibrato, you know, there's different ways to do vibrato. There's what I think of as the rock guitar vibrato, which goes kind of across the neck. You know, and when you do rock vibrato, you're going above the pitch and back to the pitch. But then what I think of as the more classical guitar vibrato goes parallel to the string like this. And in this one, you're actually going both above and below the pitch because when you push toward the um, bridge, you're actually lowering the pitch. You know, by pushing that way, you're taking tension off the string. When you push back this way, then it means you're going to um, you, you're going to be bringing the, the tension up and so you're making the, the vibrato go higher. So this is kind of above and below 
um, the main pitch. So that's uh, so, sort of what I would talk about with uh, vibrato. As far as how to practice vibrato, a lot of times I suggest practicing up by the body of the guitar, and you can use the body of, guitar, of the guitar to kind of rhythmically hit your uh, hand against, and that helps you control the rhythm of the vibrato. So like... So you wanna just kind of make an even vibrato, and you can do a faster vibrato. And again, hitting the side of the guitar just kind of makes you aware of how fast you're going, or you can do a slower vibrato. But you're just trying to get a nice um, sort of variation of the pitch up and down. So you kind of have your fingertip sitting in place and just the rest of your hands moving. So what we don't wanna do is we don't wanna slide the finger. You know, some beginners, it's like, hey, I'm gonna do vibrato. And they're like, you know, sliding the hand back and forth. No, no, no. We want the tip of the finger still, and we're just kind of moving the hand um, and, you know, helping that to create the vibrato. Now, I see Bluesy Blues Man says, what does it mean for the tremolo to be controlled? Now, our tendency sometimes is like thumb is by itself, and then AMI is a group. And so just trying to accent the M helps. P-A-M-I, P-A-M-I. You know, if you accent the M, then sometimes accenting the M can help you to eliminate that unevenness. So, um, so accenting the M is helpful. And also, like I said, practicing the PAMI all on a single string is helpful. And just kind of noticing where is the unevenness of your tremolo, where is the nail uh, maybe not um, you know, as loud as the others or something like that. Um, so, you know, just listening, like, are any of my, um, fingers sticking out, uh, when I do my tremolo? And if so, uh, do I need to, uh, to adjust that? Now I see Wanna Sleep says any tips on reducing the sound of nail clicking when playing tremolo? Well, when you're playing slowly, you really wanna plant the fingers on the string. So. And by doing that, you're gonna eliminate some of that nail click. You know, you're gonna get just more of a pure tone. So I would say planting is a solution there. Uh, now I'm gonna loop back in the chat for a second. I saw that there was a question by Ash about um, importance of competitions and applying to schools. Uh, do schools expect you to have played with orchestra before going in? Uh, my current school doesn't have many concerto opportunities. So certainly those things are helpful, but not essential. You know, I mean, if you've won a competition or if you've played with an orchestra, those are great things to put on your resume as you apply for graduate school. Uh, but you certainly don't have to have those things. I would say even if there are some small competitions competitions you could enter um, that it never hurts and you know one of the things I'll say about competitions sometimes people get very caught up with competitions um, and you know like hey if I lose then maybe I'm just not any good as a musician or if I win uh, then I'm the best I'm better than everybody else and I think that's unhealthy I think you know some people say hey well you know forget it I'm never going to compete because competitions are just an unhealthy thing for musicians. I think competitions have their place. I think what competitions do is they challenge you to play your best, uh, but what you don't want to do is you don't want to put too much weight on the competition. So um, again, I think if you're trying to sort of bolster your case to get into grad school, entering a competition is a great thing, but I would enter it with the attitude like, hey, I'm going to do my best, win or lose. Um, and one of my teachers used to say that entering a competition, the worst case scenario is you play better than you've ever played in your life. Um, you know, in other words, you may make a new personal best because you challenge yourself to get ready for the competition. And so, um, you know, that process of preparing for the competition is maybe more valuable than actually the competition itself. Uh, but certainly I would say, yeah, get all the experiences like that you can, but certainly don't, uh, don't worry about, um, about, not having certain opportunities before you apply to grad school. Um, just, you know, make the most of the opportunities you do have. 
Um, very good. So if anybody has any other questions on Tremolo or anything else we've been talking about or vibrato, et cetera, let me know. You know, another question that I had gotten in advance was about uh, left hand finger independence. I think it might have been a question from Skeet Joystick talking about left hand finger independence and will the Scott Tennant exercises really help uh, with issues with chord switches. And yeah, I think the, the Scott Tennant um, left hand finger independence exercises are really good so you know i've talked before about the fixed finger exercises you know where uh, you're going from one string to another and uh, you, you know you've maybe put all your fingers on the third string and you're just moving a single finger and then you can do the same thing um, you know with in this case your middle finger or your ring finger and then your pinky And so, uh, and then with, with Scott Tennant, he actually goes to alternating fingers, um, you know, so alternating two and one, for example, alternating three and two, and even alternating three and four, which is really quite challenging. And so those are great exercises for left hand finger independence. Um, you can even practice finger independence away from the guitar. So just practice, you know, like alternating a couple of your fingers back and forth, you know, uh, on the back of your other hand or something like that. Um, and that can be a way to work on your finger independence as well. But yeah, I think finger independence really does help with chord switches. Uh, now, another question I had gotten was uh, when shifting, uh, a lot of experienced guitarists kind of use the left elbow to lead the left arm when shifting. And I think that's a really helpful technique. So um, yeah, if you're trying to make your shifting better, I would say, you know, like if you're shifting up to the, to the seventh fret, you know, maybe your left elbow just kind of leads. And if you're going back to the second fret, you know, I would just have that elbow lead the arm a little bit in the shift. And it doesn't have to be a huge movement. You know, sometimes when I say that to somebody, um, you know, then they're like, oh, this is how my elbow needs to go before I shift. And they kind of get a, an extremely strange uh, position. No, no, no. It's just very subtle. You just a little movement of the elbow, just leading the hand. And you can do that with, you know, a, a chord shape as well. So Gord says, welcome to Canada, time to shovel my snow again. So uh, I know you're dealing with a lot of snow up there, Gord. Uh, down here in Virginia, in the U.S., we don't have as much snow right now, thankfully. So, um, you know, although I enjoy snow, I don't uh, love the shoveling of it quite so much. Um, now, another uh, shifting question that I'd received in advance was about when making a shift, do I ever think ahead and look for a common note uh, on the same string in both chords that I can use as a guide? Um, yeah, definitely. So like, let's take Lagrima, for example. Um, you know, when you have kind of this same left hand shape of four and one, even if the two contract, you can use that as a guide. Now, a lot of times when I use a finger as a guide when I'm shifting, one of the things I'll do is I'll lift on the bass if possible and just slide on the treble. Because when you slide on the basses, a lot of times you'll get a kind of scraping noise. Uh, but when you slide on the trebles, you don't get that scraping noise. So again, on Lagrima, I will lift on the bass and slide only on the treble. And so yeah, using that guide finger can really be helpful. Uh, now, another question I got about shifting was, um, hey, if you're shifting from two chords, uh, you know, that have no real common notes, uh, no common fingerings, how do you do that? Do you build the next chord in the air? And the answer is yes, absolutely. So let's say, for example, if I were going from here to here, you know, and these chords really aren't um, the same shape uh, and it's a big shift. So one of the things I'll do is I'll actually go to that next shape in the air as I shift. And one way to do this is to actually make the new shape in the same place. So it's going to sound a little weird, but you know, just make that new shape in the same place on the guitar. And then you can kind of work your way up. You know, so, um, so ultimately I want to change to that shape so that when I'm doing my quick shift, I've already got my hand in the next chord shape before I arrive. So that can be really, really helpful for shifting in the air. Um, and, um, you know, another question I got was, does it help to have a guide finger, even if you're coming from very high frets up over the body of the guitar? Uh, yeah, it absolutely can help 
uh, to have a, a guide finger when you're shifting down from very high. And I try to keep my hand position fairly similar up here so that when I slide down, um, you know, my hand isn't in a drastically different position, you know, and uh, is it important to kind of lean over and uh, look at what you're doing? And I would say, um, I would say when you're in the high positions, the one thing I do is I bring my left elbow forward a little bit, uh, and that helps me get past the body of the guitar. Uh, but I don't really lean forward like this to try to see you know, the higher positions. I just bring the elbow forward and it allows me to rotate uh, you know, the forearm past the guitar a little bit, makes it a little easier uh, to get into the higher position. Uh, so I see uh, Voyage said, good idea, elbow leading. I think this can help me. So great, uh, Voyage. I'm glad that's helpful to you. And um, again, if there's any last questions, uh, drop them in the chat. I've got about just a few more minutes before I need to wrap up for today. Um, another topic was just practicing your left hand position. And one of my favorite uh, ways to practice left hand position is with the chromatic scale. Uh, so for example, on the uh, first four frets, you know, just like open first, second, third, fourth, open first, second, third, fourth, open first, second, third, fourth, open first, second, third. I only go to the third fret there on the third string, and then open first, second, third, fourth, open first, second, third, fourth, and then backwards, fourth, third, second, first, open open, fourth, third, second, first, open, third, second, first, open, fourth, third, second, first, open, fourth, third, second, first, open, fourth, third, second, first, open. And so a chromatic scale is playing every sharp and flat as opposed to a di diatonic scale like major or minor where you're kind of skipping over some notes. And the reason I love the chromatic scale for practicing left hand position is because it works every left hand finger evenly. And so when I'm you know, doing the chromatic scale, I can make sure that none of my fingers are being neglected um, in you know, getting the right position. And so typically what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to keep the thumb behind the neck really supporting the pressure of the left hand fingers. Uh, typically the thumb is kind of behind my middle finger, um, roughly there, maybe it's slightly to the left of my middle finger, supporting behind the neck. And um, typically my second and third fingers are fairly straight on. My first and fourth fingers are kind of, um, you know, over to either side, maybe leaning a little bit on the side, but the second and third are kind of more straight on. I'm generally trying to get each finger directly behind the fret wire. So I, wanna, I don't want to be too far back because then I'll get a buzz. I want to be right by the fret wire to get a good clear tone. Um, and uh, so I, I want to be uh, getting right by each fret wire. I want to have my inactive fingers, those not playing at a given time, in close to the fingerboard. So I don't want to have sort of flyaway fingers way far from the fingerboard. I want to keep them uh, nice and close in. So um, I have kind of a checklist for myself. You know, when I'm working on the chromatic scale, do I have a straight wrist? curved fingers, the active finger, that is the one playing at the given time close to the fret wire, the inactive fingers close to the fingerboard, and is my thumb behind the neck supporting the pressure kind of between the second and first fingers. Uh, so if I have those things, uh, straight wrist, curved fingers, active fingers close to fret, inactive fingers close to the fretboard, thumb behind the neck, then I have a good left hand position. Now I see Ash says in the chat, what are some pieces to look at uh, to better approach Scarlatti? I played K11 years ago, want to look at some of his lesser known repertoire for guitar. Thank you so much for doing a Q&A today. Absolutely, Ash, thanks for tuning in. I'm glad you joined the Q&A today. Uh, so how do you better approach Scarlatti? Well, I would say, you know, just dive in. Whatever Scarlatti piece you want to do, um, go ahead and dive in. One thing I will say, though, is a lot of Scarlatti pieces don't work um, super well on the guitar because they were designed for keyboard. And so, um, you know, some, some Scarlatti pieces just work better than others on guitar. But um, part of it depends, are you wanting to arrange the Scarlatti piece for guitar yourself? Are you wanting to use an existing arrangement? So obviously if you find an existing arrangement you really like, then that'd be the place to start. If you're gonna arrange it yourself, then I would say it's really thinking about what's gonna work well on guitar. And sometimes you have to omit certain notes, um, change the voicing of certain chords to really make it work on guitar. Um, you know, again, sometimes we, I know I've been guilty of this where it's like, hey, I'm going to play absolutely every note in the original uh, keyboard version. Well, that's just not feasible on the guitar. So I remember Roland Deans, who I admired a lot as an arranger, uh, he would say that you want to make an arrangement sound like it was written for the guitar. And so I think, you know, whether you're playing an existing arrangement of Scarlatti or making your own arrangement, you want to adapt it in a way that really makes it sound like, wow, that Scarlatti piece was written for guitar and uh, not just 
uh, kind of forcing yourself to try to play every single note in the original, even if it doesn't work on the guitar. So hopefully that helps, Ash. Uh, Wanna Sleep says, how to practice for tone consistencies. Uh, my tone at high notes are dr drastically different from lower position. Uh, well, I think, you know, there's different aspects of tone, but, you know, when you think about the right hand, I would make sure that I'm planting and getting a good combination of nail and flesh. Um, and I would think, you know, for higher positions, one of the things to think about is the spacing between your left and right hand. If your left and right hand are too close, the tone's going to sound bad. So let's say I put my right hand right over by my left hand. It's just not going to come out very well. So I need more spacing between my left and right hand. So think proportion, you know, in other words, if I'm plucking over the sound hole and I'm playing the first fret, I'm playing roughly one third of the vibrating string. But if I'm on the 13th fret, then I actually need to move my right hand closer to the bridge to still be playing one third of the vibrating string. So you wanna think proportionally, you know, where is my left hand and then what does that mean for my right hand? And so you wanna kind of adjust a little bit your right hand um, so that it's not like this nasty tone that you get if your hands are too close together. So I think that may help uh, with the question from Wanna Sleep about um, you know, where to position the right hand, how to get a good clear tone. So I'm gonna have to wrap up the stream there. I really appreciate you guys tuning in. Uh, I'll plan to do this again next Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern time, so I hope you can tune in. And uh, hopefully you can carefully position your right hand over the subscribe button if you've enjoyed this stream and subscribe to this channel for more videos that will help you to improve your guitar playing. Thanks for watching and keep making music.